Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome to Breakout Trading Answered, the show where we talk about all things breakout trading. And today, of course, we have Mr. Breakout Trading himself, Thomas Nesnado. <laughs> Welcome, Thomas. <laughs> Welcome back, everyone. This is so funny because Andrew, last in the last uh, uh, live uh, episode, Andrew called me yeah. Mr. Breakouts for the very first time, and it was totally spontaneous. It wasn't prepared in any way. It just came out out of his head. And since then, I've been constantly called Mr. Breakout. So maybe this is going to be my new nickname, and you'll see more and more, more often uh, talking to not anymore Thomas, but Mr. Breakouts. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. That's your your new nickname. Now it's going to stick. I'm going to make sure of it. So, <laughs> it's hello, every, stick, everyone. Yes. Welcome to the show. We can see we got some uh, some hellos in the chat already. So please uh, say welcome to Mr. Breakouts. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> Mark, welcome. Hi, guys. We sure are live. We're here today, uh, speaking to you right now. One, looking forward for this event. G'day, one. Good to see you here. Welcome, Olga. Always nice to see you. Egyptians here again. Billion dollar algorithms. I finally caught this live. Welcome, Billion. Good to see you here. Where are you coming from, Billion? Why is it? Uh, is this a strange time for you? Sko, welcome, Sko. And Egyptian says, Mr. Breakout Trader. MBT. MBT. Even MBT. better. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We've got a... Uh, excellent topic that we're going to discuss today. It uh, extends on our How to Make Breakout Trading Work series. Um, what topics have we, uh, what sectors or groups have we covered so far, Thomas? Do you remember? Well, yeah. So we got, I, I almost remember because I knew that, I know that we started from the easiest one and my favorite one. So we started yeah. with indexes because indexes are really easy. Then we continued with energies and energies are also very easy. And then we continued yes. with grains because grains are not so easy, but I love them. And then we continued with metals because who doesn't like metal? I, metals, I like them as well. Mm. And then we continued with softs. And did I forget something? I think that's it. That's. I think there's one we missed. Anyway, we've done a lot. <laughs> yeah, we done. I feel a lot. like we've done six, and you just mentioned five. Anyway. Mm. Anyway, okay. yeah. <laughs> if you want to know what they are, and you have, and you didn't join us on those uh, live events, then go and check out the YouTube channel. We've got uh, loads of good videos in there, and don't forget to hit subscribe and the bell button to get notified when we release new content. So today, what are we going to be talking about, Thomas? Which sector are we going after today? So we're going to talk about currencies and it's quite this is quite an interesting uh, one because you know I already said that we're pretty much moving from the easiest to the hardest and I'm not going to share with you what is the hardest one because that will be at the very end uh, and uh, uh, we will cover it very very soon but currencies are definitely one of the hardest and you know when I was thinking about currency trading and currencies uh, today I realized, so first of all, I should explain something. We're talking about futures currencies. We trade uh, futures contracts and we trade, we talk about futures currencies. Now, what is quite important to understand that when we talk about futures currencies like uh, Aussie dollar or British pound or euro currency, it's basically a currency pair like in Forex. Uh, every time it's a currency against US dollars. So when I say we trade US dollars, we will talk about uh, Aussie dollar, we're actually talking about uh, pair Aussie dollar against uh, against um, US dollar. So mm. even if you have a look on these um, pairs in Forex sector and you compare them to futures, there's very high correlation. Now, there is there is point why, why I'm saying this. So um, as I said, currencies are really, really difficult. It, these are very hard markets, and I believe that every trader will uh, confirm that, at least every breakout trader. Now, Andrew, here is a very interesting part that I've been thinking about today, the whole day. Mm -hmm. Why so many people start with Forex when currencies are the most probably the most difficult markets to develop functional viable long-term viable strategies on doesn't make any sense does it why would you start with the hardest well yeah that's a good question i'm not sure people the forex traders realize it's the hardest i suspect yeah, they I might so start well. trading forex because of the small account size you can use 
the picker yeah, locks and all that yeah. kind of thing. But I'm not sure. Good question. Yeah. So I was asking my question as well, and I think I think probably it's also because of the uh, small account they can start with. Mm. Uh, but now they can start futures with micros, so there's no that much of a difference anymore. And again, with mi micros, these traders can start uh, trading something which is much easier, much easier like this micro uh, indices, micro energies. So again, if if you guys in forex, it's your decision. But I just want to tell you. Anything related to currency trading, be it futures contracts uh, or forex, it's really hard. And if you want to succeed fast, this is not the easiest and uh, fastest path. Uh, definitely not. Uh, so that was my opening. And now we can go to currencies, Andrew. Yeah, sure. I th I, we got a couple of uh, um, good comments in the chat. So Rob uh, said low entry level and Sko said leverage. So I think both of those mm. are definitely... Um, um, and one said actually they have really low margins and good leverage as well. So, um, yeah, but but but, I think but you know, yeah. still still not enough of an advantage uh, that would uh, compensate for the difficultness difficulty to develop viable strategies with high failure rate. And also we need to understand that forex is not a centralized market, whereas futures are a centralized market. So that means it's way better regulated. And you know, I I. I I know a couple of forex trader uh, brokers, and I know that uh, in forex area there are things that could never happen uh, with futures. Meaning that futures environment, futures trading environment is way more transparent, and you will have way less of a risk of stuff that can be risky with forex. And I don't want to go into depth here, but I just want to say definitely better to think about micros than forex at least from my experience and understanding and knowledge yeah uh, billion billion dollar algorithms let me put this on the screen because this is billions first uh, attendance in the live show i started with fx because of account minimums and it's simple to understand compared to options or futures contract complications yeah options are of course, options are very complicated, yeah. but futures are not that complicated. They seem to be complicated at the beginning, but it's so easy that uh, it's it's a just a matter of a little bit of an effort. Uh, but I I can promise you it's not complicated. And yeah. again, it's better to understand something a little bit more complicated than than starting with something where the odds are against you way more than with futures markets. Again, my opinion, <laughs> my experience. Yeah. I think the the futures contract um, expiry and rollover and the schedule is probably a little bit more complicated to understand than just um, you know doing uh, forex currency pairs. But um, yeah, let's get into the show. And I can see Far Far had has put a good question in the chat, which we'll come back to Far had um, a little bit later in the show because that's a good one. So how about we get started, Thomas? I know you've yes, got some slides so, for us today. Yeah, so let's bring slides. By the way, we will have two strategies reviews. So guys, strategy review is coming today awesome. as well. We have two of them. I love that. So we're yeah. talking about currencies and I opened uh, maybe a little bit with a little bit uh, of uh, controversy because I know there are a lot of uh, Forex traders around, but I, uh, hey, I just gave an honest opinion why I believe that uh, this might be one of the reasons why a lot of Forex traders are not successful because it is hard. And uh, when we talk about uh, currencies on futures markets, let's start with, uh, let me actually show you how hard these are. So on the next slide, we can go next one, please. This is the list of commonly traded futures markets uh, with currencies. So obviously this is futures for Australian dollar, British pound, Canadian dollar, Euro, Japanese and Swiss franc. And it's always, you know, it's like uh, it's uh, you can compare it to AD versus USD pair, BP versus USD pair, and so go on. Now you can already see from this chart that on two uh, currencies, which is uh, Australian dollar and Canadian dollar, we have never ever been able to develop a single strategy. Like never. Whatever we did, whatever we tried, we never developed a single strategy on. Australian dollar and Canadian dollar. Uh, with other sectors, we even we at least we might not be like with softs, we might not be completely successful, but we are, uh, at least were close. But with these markets, we were not even close. 
So that basically left us with uh, four markets that are tradable and uh, doable with breakout trading. And all of them can be good markets, like really good. And I will show you some examples as well. You just need to be super patient and it's totally doable to, do, to develop a breakout trading strategies uh, with, for British pound, euro currency, Japanese yen, and Swiss franc. And I think all of these are pretty good markets. We do trade some of them uh, in our hedge fund as well. Not all of them, but some of them as well. And uh, it is doable, but you really need to be patient. Now, when I had a look on how many strategies on futures currencies we have in our hedge fund database, I was positively surprised. I, I honestly did not <laughs> expect that. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that altogether we have 108 breakout strategies on currencies in our database, which really considering how hard these uh, markets are, it's quite an achievement. So maybe it's more doable that I'm trying to, you know, undersell it here. Uh, you can see that we have the vast majority on is on Japanese yen, which I think is the easiest one, definitely easiest one. Euro currency, then no, the second one is British pound. The third one is Swiss franc, and the fourth one is euro currency. Um, That's the other way around. So, yeah. Thomas. The, yeah, the second yeah. one's euro. The third one from the left is Swiss franc, and then the last one oh, is yeah. British pound. Yeah, thank you. Should make uh, that font okay, bigger, yeah. shouldn't we? Next time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's a little bit. It's a little bit small. I can barely. That's yeah. why I'm leaning forward yeah. because. I can barely see it. But overall, 108 breakout strategies, that's not bad. Again, proves that it's doable. And definitely, if you're starting out with currencies, I would suggest starting with the Japanese yen, which, which I think you also have similar experience, right, Andrew? Like you have positive experience with Japanese yen. I remember you've been trading it for years. And I think you also struggled with uh, Aussie dollar, right? Yeah, the Japanese yen is a great one to trade. And um, it's good for um, correlations as well. I've noticed often when the uh, you know when the index markets are struggling, the Japanese yen seems to um, move quite nicely. So I've had some good results with that. I'm interested though um, to see that Swiss franc is on your list because yep. historically, you know, Swiss the Swiss has been pegged to the US dollar, and then mm -hmm. you know every now and then they would make a comment about the peg or they they would adjust the peg and and it would have a lot of um, you know, volatility or implications into that, that market. So how do you, do you, do you do anything to your breakout trading development when you have a market like that? So first of all, that's a great question. So first of all, I have to, have to say, honestly, we do not trade Swiss franc strategies. We don't trade them. So we mm. develop strategies, but you know, it, it was like a challenge. Like we took it like a sport, like, how many markets we can crack. And we were really happy that we could crack Swiss franc. But at the end of the day, we do not trade it. Uh, I think one of the reasons is also low average trade, which is another challenge with this market. But it is doable. But yeah, I agree. There might be some some uh, challenges. But I think overall, even the average trade, there are, there, there, I don't remember exactly, but there were so many challenges with, uh, with um, Swiss franc that we just didn't, pull the trigger and we we do not trade them but we do trade japanese yen life as you said it's a great market we do trade euro currency that's a good market as well uh, and we do trade the british pound life as well that that's quite a good market as well yeah yeah and to your question earlier the aussie dollar yeah i haven't really built anything good for the aussie dollar or canadian dollar i think um it doesn't really move enough like every now and then mm. it does, usually with interest rate decisions and things. But outside of that, it's, it doesn't have doesn't seem to have enough potential for the way we trade. So mm. um, we've got a couple of questions here, Thomas. I think uh, a few of these would be good to answer now just to give a bit more background into the results you just shared. <clears throat> Excuse me. So one would like to know, do you guys develop this 108 strategies with your method, the one at Better Trader Academy? Yeah, exactly the same method. Like ev all the, everything we share on this show, like my results, my H1 results, that's exactly the same method. It's 100% with this method. Yeah. Okay, here's a good one from Billion Dollar Algos. Yen will always trend. I use mean reversion on Aussie dollar. 
I agree. Aussie US is difficult to break out trade. Mm. Yeah. So that's a good one. Thanks for that. Um, and Mark, this is a two parter. Here we go. Um, not that the fundamentals should be our focus, but I find a comment very interesting that I once heard. Currency pairs that are similar in terms of culture and political structure, for example, don't have lots of excitement. This would explain the differences between um, the yen and the Aussie US dollar. <laughs> I think as well, yeah, I think as well, part of it is that, um, you know, Australia is very uh, commodities driven. It's a commodity driven currency. And I think to some extent, the the Canadian uh, dollar is as well. So I think mm. from, from my Forex experience many, many years ago, the Aussie and the Canadian um, kind of behaved in the same way. Um, that was 10 years ago. I don't watch currencies that much now. So that could also be, uh, there could be something to that, Mark. I agree. <laughs> yeah. All right, Thomas, that looks like it's um, it's all for the comments right now. So would you like to continue on? Yeah, with so let, let's go to practicalities because I think that's, mm. that's the important part that we always share here and then some examples. So, you know, you know, the practicalities, if we move on, uh, let's talk about time sessions and time templates. And again, it's quite surprising because we found one very particular time, uh, mm, not time template, the, mm, the session time? Session, uh, yeah, the, yeah. Uh, Trading session? <laughs> No, the time frame. Ah, time frame. Okay. <laughs> it's like time frame. We we, we found yeah. very very special time frame that seems to be uh, the best working time frame on, on all currencies, which I'm going to share in a minute. Very interesting. But before that, uh, when it comes to um, sessions, so all futures uh, currencies they have the regular trading sessions uh, seven twenty to. 2 p.m. the market time, the exchange time. However, we found uh, some uh, other sessions that seem to work pretty well as well. So as I said for AD, we, we by volume, there are some possibilities, but we didn't develop any strategy. But for British pound, it's, it, it you can start al already earlier. So there can be alternative session 2 a.m. to 2 p.m., which seems to work, work pretty well. Uh, and for euro currency, again, same uh, from 2 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, and uh, similar for Japanese yen. So basically, this, uh, this is like a universal second time session from 2 a.m. to 2 p.m., which we found to work pretty well. Uh, and on Japanese yen, we, we also found uh, that 24 hours, like full session, can work quite all right as well. And it looks like uh, we're getting to the point where Euro currency will be tradable 24 hours uh, uh, as well. And I mean, it is already tradable, but uh, when we will be able to create some strategies as well. Um, so we're, we mostly work with these extended sessions from 2 a.m. to 2 p.m., uh, but we do also have some strategies with this base uh, session 7.20 to 2 p.m. And uh, all the strategies that we were able to develop on currencies are swing strategies. So if you uh, use this um, this default session, 7.20 to 2 p.m., you need to understand that there will be some overnight gaps. And uh, I remember we had a couple of really, really ugly gaps. I think it was on Japanese yen uh, like two or three times during the last five years. So. I remember we, we, we did have some overnight gaps which skipped over our stop loss and we got a, with a bigger loss than anticipated. So that's why we now also lean more towards these um, longer sessions from 2 a.m. to 2 p.m. where the risk is highly mitigated and we haven't had any problem with execution uh, since then. Yeah. So these, um, these time zones you've got mentioned here, that's exchange time, right? For CME? Correct. Yes. Exchange yep. time. Yep. Okay. Um, we've got a few questions in the chat, but I feel like you may be answering them in the next slide or two. So maybe just continue on a bit and. Uh, yeah. We'll see. So now the magic uh, time frame. <laughs> and this is really funny, but for some reason, 
Hmm. The magic number for currencies is 80 minutes. Like if you start building breakout strategies on 80 minute charts, that almost seems to be the magic number, the default one. Although wow. with uh, Euro and Japanese Yen, you can also use 30 minutes, which seems to be working pretty well as well. But you know, 80 minutes for some reason seems to be a great default, uh, basically for any currency. So I don't know why, but it is what it is, 80 minutes. <laughs> Quite mm. interesting, isn't it? Yep, very interesting. Um, so do we have some questions? Well, we have questions about uh, transaction costs and slippage and things. Do you think that's a good time to go through those now? I'm just uh, scrolling uh, up. Yeah. Do you want to so do those can, now or, or in? Yeah, we can, we can, we, we can uh, quickly cover them. Uh, so yeah. we, we okay. have not experienced any crazy slippages so far. Uh, so what is the level of average trade of the yeah. transactional costs? Yeah, okay. So 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 we, we have a very, very simple method of calculating these. So our criteria is that the minimum average trade uh, to even think about strategy to trade it live. And as I said, for example, we do not achieve this with many swing Swiss franc strategies, is that uh, the average trade needs to be three to four times, and we lean more towards the four times of transactional cost. Now, transactional cost, overall, we don't, we have quite all right execution uh, on currencies, which is one tick on entry slip and one on exit, and then, of course, the commission. So, for, as a, for example, uh, Japanese yen, if I'm not mistaken, Andrew, Japanese yen one tick is uh, $12.5, right? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so we have so that means we have one tick <clears throat> on entry, one tick on uh, exit. That that is twenty five dollar uh, twenty five. Yeah, uh, plus five commission. That's thirty. So you ideally would have to have uh, average trade somewhere between let's say ninety and one hundred twenty. That's already the ideal average trade, and it's it's challenging, but it's doable. It's easier for, let's say, British pound, where you have, I think it's 6.25. So one tick on entry, one on tick on exit. We're talking about approximately 13 plus uh, five commissions. So that's 18 multiplied by three. So we're talking about something like 50, between 55 to 75. So one British pound, the average trade has to be between 55 to 75. And again, we're more towards 75 to uh, allow that strategy be considered for the final portfolio. But overall, I'm, I, I'm really positively surprised we have not uh, seen uh, any super crazy slippages that we could see on other markets like coffee or silver or even, even the E-mini Dow Jones can get sometimes way bigger slippage than, than currencies, at least in our case, quite surprisingly. Not bad at all. Mm. Okay, thanks, Thomas. Uh, here's a question from Arek. So you just mentioned you just answered the first part about slippage, but the second part, can you talk about correlations versus other futures markets? Uh, I do not remember them. Uh, again, mm. the good source could be um, MRCI, but definitely they do have good correlations. Uh, or let, let me rephrase it. They will add a very good improvement when it comes to average correlation to your portfolio. It will help you tremendously with the portfolio correlations. That That's one of the reasons we have them there. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we have another question here from Olga. For stress testing, do you use these six currency markets? This is very interesting. That's a very good question. That's a very mm. good question. Yeah, we do use all of them. However, it's really hard to stress test currencies because most will fail anyway. So we, I would say we're way more benevolent. We're more way more relaxed with stress testing on currencies. And uh, if we have a currency that passes, basically if we pass just on one other currency, that's already... A positive uh, green signal for us. And again, this is an exception 
because this is very tough and very different category of markets, but we're way more relaxed and uh, we allow uh, to be pretty loose with our normal regular stress testing criteria. So if it passes, just if just cross test one other currency market, that's already great. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. Um, and then Woohoo put a comment daily, which I assume it was reference to the time frame um, slide we just put up. Thomas, why not daily? Daily charts for currencies. They just don't produce results. Not just enough sample we, size? Yeah, as well. Mm -hmm. Like we didn't try directly daily. We, we tried the 360 minutes or something like this, which is close mm -hmm. to daily. Uh, the, the Basically, it's daily, but expressing minutes. We didn't get results. We really get best results with 80 minutes and alternatively 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And that's it. <laughs> okay. Fair enough, if that's what the numbers say. All right, so do you want to continue on with the slides? Because I think you've got some examples coming up next, right? Yeah, that, that's the interesting part. I'll, I'll be looking to my monitor just to see all these okay. numbers. So let's, let's go on. So uh, I have uh, an example for each of these um, currencies. So first one is from British Pound. And it is 80 minutes, 80 minutes time frame. And... Um, also, something I forgot to mention that all currencies we trade them both long and short. These are this is pretty nice about this current, except for I think in Japanese yen th there is some bias. I think it's more like a short bias or something like that. But the point is that uh, you can definitely uh, find strategies uh, on both sides, long and short with currencies. So the first one is on British pound and. Uh, you see, so for example, the average rate is 74.19. So that's about 75. So we're pretty much on the higher side of what I said a couple of minutes ago, ago that should be the ideal average trade. So that's pretty good. And then we have uh, uh, on this 10 years uh, history, we have 42,000 net profit versus 4,000 drawdown. So the net profit drawdown ratio is 10 to 1, which again, it's, it's ideal. Anything 10 to 1 or better, it's really, really good. That's one of our criteria. And then anything uh, on the equity curve, anything uh, passing the vertical uh, chart, it's a true auto sample, not traded auto sample, but as we keep updating our database. So we develop this strategy some time ago and we keep updating our database. So this data didn't even exist uh, when we created this strategy. So it's a true out of sample. The downside is that we have a little bit lower sample size. Uh, we have about five. Actually, that's five a pretty good nine. one. Yeah, that's a yeah. Pr pretty good one. That's almost 600. Yeah, I, I know that there's, so it's another example where, where I think we have even lower. So overall, that's that's really good. Uh, like all these numbers are quite uh, good. The true auto sample is good as well. And as I said, British pound, pretty tradable, good currency market. Although you really need to be have a lot of patience to uh, find something out. Now let's move to euro, euro currency. So mm -hmm. this is thirty minutes again, long and short. This is a really good sample size. It's almost thousand uh, trades on ten years history. Uh, now you can see we have a we struggle with the average trade. So this is a candidate that we would definitely not uh, deploy in our hedge fund uh, for live trading because the average trade is just forty seven. This is this is kind of a struggle, as I said, with a lot of currencies. With that, you know, sometimes it's really uh, the reason why we uh, cannot find anything meaningful because average trade can be too low, uh, but. Except for that, again, 44,000 uh, profit. It, this is always per one contract, one unit. Mm -hmm. And 4,000 drawdown. So again, 10 to 1, which is quite all right. High percentage when 64%, uh, high sample size, high profit factor of 1.38. So again, except for the low average trade, very nice out of sample uh, performance, real out of sample performance, perfectly matching the un in sample performance. So this is another case that proves that once we get uh, 
a currency breakout strategy. These are doing pretty well in in throughout of sample and uh, you know are pretty good in portfolios. It's just a matter of finding them. That that is what what is really hard. Next one we have on Japanese yen, our favorite. Uh, this is 60 minute again, long short. And here is something I want to. So first of all, we already have quite all right average trade here. It's 80. What is it? Oh, actually, no, this one. This is just 63. So again, again, similar problem. We would struggle with average trade. That's why we would not trade it. But the reason why, why I deliberately picked this example is for a different reason. And the reason is that you can see that this, uh, strat this strategy would, uh, in 10 years per one unit, would uh, create 21,000, 21 and a half thousand US dollars uh, profit for maximum drawdown two thousand dollars only so it's just 10 it's again 10 to 1 ratio which is very mm. nice but the interesting part is that you can find uh, japanese yen strategies with really low drawdown so i think japanese yen can be really considered uh, for even smaller uh, accounts because you can find strategies with with uh, small drawdowns and it's really hard to find breakout strategy on futures market with a small drawdown is 2000 it's it's i don't even know if we achieve that on any other market this and especially nowadays it's really for a for a regular market not for a micro but for regular it's really very very small uh drawdown uh this is the case with smaller sample size this is 339 only so that's probably another reason why we would not trade it but overall you can see again very nice uh, true out of sample performance and uh, overall, not bad. Pretty good-looking strategy, which, which again is quite often the case with currencies. Yeah. And then the final one we have Thomas, for the switch. Sorry, before yes? you before you move on, yes? I, I just yes. a question for you. So people watching this may think, um, okay, so I did twenty-one k over ten years. It's not very much money. Why would you bother? Yeah, because this is one contract. This is just one mm. unit. Right, so you can take you can uh, trade ten contracts and you would make uh, two hundred thousand uh, dollars. Right, so this is for one contract, one unit. Yeah. Everything is normalized per one unit. Uh, you can scale it up as much as you want. You can have as many contracts as you want. So, good question. Thank you for clarifying or letting me to clarify this, Andrew. And yep. again, don't forget the other reason is that we we want to create strategies not always just for money, but for the sake of correlations. We The ultimate goal is to create a low correlated portfolio, which will be as stable with as predictable and stable distribution of profits as possible. And it's not always just about how much money the strategy makes. It's about how well it fits to portfolio because of correlations. Actually, I used to know a trader who were willing to trade even strategies that long term went, went sideways and didn't make any money whatsoever just because in times of making money they had a outstanding correlations to the rest of his portfolio and mm. that's the true that's the true uh, ex high level like advanced mindset uh, because that's what we need to understand it's it's about his correlations and portfolio yep yep and in this screenshot what does even trades mean Break even? Is that what it is? Yes, yes, yes. That's a break right. even. Yeah, break yep. even trade. Okay. You can go to the next example. Thanks for answering those questions. Yeah, thank you for asking. That was a very yeah. good clarification. So the last one is Swiss franc. And as, and as I said, we, we do have a couple of strategies for Swiss franc, but we do not trade any of them. And as I said, there are a lot of, you know, potential struggles with this. So for example, this one has got a pretty good average trade. It's, oh, actually it's 60, it looks like 80. So so that that's one of the, as I said, one of the struggles uh, overall, and especially in this Swiss franc, like it's hard to find something with reasonable average trade. Although I think 60 maybe could be considered. Uh, I think it's again, $6.25 per one take, so that could be considered. But the, the bigger problem is that we couldn't find a strategy, for example, with good uh, net profit drawdown ratio. Here we have twenty-five thousand dollar profit versus 
5,000 drawdown. So it's five to one, which is really low. And um, that so that that's one of the reasons why we probably would have consi considered that. And overall, uh, despite the fact that we found a couple of Swiss franc strategies, none of them blew us away. None of them would be like, for example, for Japanese yen, we can find really nice strategies or for British pound, even euro currency, but for Swiss franc, like we know it's doable. We have them uh, in the database. They do perform quite all right in out of sample, to out of sample as well. But um, uh, there are so many pitfalls that uh, we just do not deploy them. But again, it's doable. It's tradable. Okay, great. Thank you. Thomas, is that the end of the examples? Yeah, so so you, you, have, you have the idea, guys. You see, it's 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 quite doable. It's not like you could not do that. It just it's hard. It's hard. But you know, once you have once once you will have developed strategies on all the on the other futures markets, you really want to, you know, move the needle and you want to also challenge yourself and see if you can get uh, strategies for the rest as well. And that's usually when these currency markets come in and yeah, doable. It just requires time and effort. Yep. Okay. So I think the strategy review is next, isn't it? But there's a couple of questions here. So let's just yes. jump back a minute. So this one's from ASF. Uh, not specific to currencies, but what's the average minimum profit per trade you're okay with in percentage terms? I we do not uh, we do not think in percentage terms uh, when it comes like our workflow is not designed in percentage. Our for, workflow is designed with a formula that I shared, which is for three to four times uh, transactional costs. That that's that's how we developed it. So we never even thought in percentages. Hmm. Okay, and then uh, I want to jump back to this question from earlier from Farhad, Farhad, let me put this up on the screen. We were talking about um, some markets, uh, uh, some currencies are difficult for breakout trading. Um, he suggested that uh, maybe it's hard for breakouts, but it's good for mean reversion. So do you have any comments or insights into that? Well, you know, as a Mr. Breakout, <laughs> I'm almost not allowed to have opinion. Okay, that's a good point. <laughs> I, I, I guys, I'm, I'm a breakout specialist, so I, I'm, I don't have experiences with mean reversions. That's not my first specialization. I decided to become very good specialist in one, only one area, which is breakout trading. And I think I'm, I really understand very deeply this area, but I have no experience with mean reversion. But I think that Andrew might be able to give some insight because he's definitely mean reversion guy as well yeah I've, I've been doing a lot of mean reversion um strategy development lately um i haven't focused too much on currencies at this stage but uh, i've done a little bit and i think what i found is that some of those markets like the aussie and the canadian uh the problem the, the challenge isn't necessarily their behavior but how much they move so uh, depending how you trade mean reversion you usually like to see a bit of volatility and um, if you don't get volatility, then I think any uh, breakout or mean reversion is is challenging. So um, I don't have enough data to say for sure that it's uh, mean reversion is better in those currencies. Uh, maybe in a couple of months, I can share some more info. Hmm. But a yeah, uh, good, good question, good ob good observation, Farhad. So thank you for that. Um, okay, we've got a couple more here. Um, Question from one: How do you select what strategies you trade? Um, well, so you know, this this is like it's got two sides. So first of all, I, mm. I do not. I have a hedge fund team, so they do it for me. So <laughs> it's a little bit hard to. But before I had had my hedge fund team use, and I still use it because I love it. Uh, the market system, I'm not. Well, sounds like we might have lost Thomas here. We'll give it a moment to come back. Are you there, Thomas? 
while we're waiting for Thomas to come back, uh, I'm interested to know, is anyone here in the uh, chat today, uh, do you trade any currencies or have you tested any? Uh, I've had a lot of good results with the Japanese yen. Um, has anyone tried the yen or any other currencies? Uh, let us know. We'll give Thomas a moment to reconnect. Unless the issue is my connection, of course. I think it's Thomas's connection. If you can still hear us, please put a Y in the chat just to see if we have we completely dropped out. Or is it Thomas who's having an issue? Okay, all right. So looks like Thomas Thomas's connection has dropped. So we'll give him a moment to uh, reconnect. Okay, so we've got some comments in the chat here. Oh, Thomas is back. Hey, Are Thomas. we back? Yeah, we're yeah, back. Yeah, I, I don't know what happened. We had some tech issue. Yeah, I'll just ask him. Internet connection. Because um, I wasn't sure if it was my connection or yours because I had a connection issue the other week. So, um, But I just asked in the chat if uh, who's trading index, um, sorry, who's trading currencies? Have they tried any yet? And... Um, Billion Dollar said, I, I mostly trade currencies, which is pretty cool. Uh, Olga, not yet. Busy with indexes. Egyptian, not yet. Um, hoping you have mine for review. I think we do have his for review, don't we? So, um, okay. Well, it looks like you're back, Thomas, and your connection is... Yeah. <laughs> the last bit we heard before you dropped off was market system analyzer you were talking about. Yeah. So that's what I use basically to, you know... Uh, uh, combine different strategies to arrive to to, to perfect portfolio. Uh, that, that's a very good. I, I just like this software. It takes some time and effort, but it it really, it really is a good one. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we also had a question from Yoka, which we'll come back to at the end. Um, good question, mm -hmm. but I think the timing will be a bit, bit better. Egyptian said Spanish broadband. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but I, ha I have I have to I have to say this Spanish. You know, I, I I live here on a not a big city on a beach, and already five years ago I got six hundred megabits of internet, which wow. which we didn't have even in Central Europe at that time. So, yeah, I I, I cannot complain about the Spanish broadband, quite honestly, <laughs> which <laughs> surprisingly. Right. Okay, so now okay, that's. Um... Uh, should we continue? Yeah, we can. So, so we have strategy. We have two strategies review, uh, mm. both from marks, different marks, and what really it's a, like a fantastic bridge because from the first mark uh, we can move on. We are actually have a currency strategy, which I think is pretty neat, isn't it? So the first uh, review is from Mark S. Uh, let me just read quickly. Hi, Andrew and Thomas. Here's the strategy for a review. If you need any more information, please let me know. So it's 80 minute swing uh, for British uh, pound. So what I really like that, you know, Mark came to the same conclusion that it's 80 minutes or maybe he already got some disinformation from me before. So 18 minute British pound swing strategy, time template from 2 a.m. to 2 p.m., great, uh, fantastic, uh, costs included, yeah, 10 years history, okay, I'm not sure on which other markets to test it. Let, let's bring up the equity curve. Next okay. slide, please. Uh, so, Mark, I have to say, this is a looking at the equity curve, just from the glance on the equity curve, it's a pretty good uh, looking uh, equity curve for currency. So, it's not bad. Like, I'm just, if, if, if you show me this, uh, it looks quite all right. I would not be at all preoccupied by the recent drawdown because you can see that we had drawdowns like this in the history. Uh, quite often, or at least a few times. So it, it's it's like part of the characteristic of this trading strategy. 
and it's not bad. Like from what I saw on British Pound, this seems to be quite a reasonable equity curve. And just like visually, I don't mind at all. You just stress test it on all the other uh, currencies. And if you if it passes at least one other currency, I think uh, it can be a very interesting strategy. Let's have a look on the statistics. That's where I struggled a little bit more. So first of all, we have 37 net profit versus uh, five and a half thousand drawdown, which for my taste is a little bit too low. So I'm not much uh, on board with this one. And the, the average trade is 49. So again, this is British pound. So we're talking about uh, 18 transactional costs. Uh, and we if we agree with three times of that, that would be at least 54, $54 dollars, 55, about 55 dollars. I personally would like to see at least 60. 50 to me seems to be too low. So uh, I think I think this is a great first attempt. Uh, Mark and I, I think it, it's really like considering how difficult uh, it is to find a breakout strategy on currencies. This is a very very good first attempt. Overall, I would not trade this strategy because, as I said, average trade is too low for me. It's even below three times of transactional cost and net profit drawdown ratio. It's too low for me as well. So these are the key reasons. But again, let me explain. I do really appreciate you share this one because it's really, really, it's a very, very good attempt. It's it really, oh, this is already after cost. After cost. Ah, yeah. okay. Okay. Well, wait. Ah, yeah. He mentioned that. Okay. Let me calculate. So he uh, mentioned 18 and a half. I, I remember now. So 18 plus 50 plus 18 and a half, 68. Uh huh. That's why we also have higher uh, drawdown and uh, lower net profit. Okay, so that's a different story. That's a different story. So we're about seventy average rate. So that that's a different picture now. So Mark, this looks pretty good. If we now get uh, including this uh, important information, this looks pretty good because that means that we have how many? We have how many trades? 750 and we have 18 and a half uh, per trade so that means that the net profit without is something closer to 50,000 so we're net profit uh, drawdown ratio 10 to 1 so that's good Mark that's good that's good and considering the equity curve is with transactional cost already that looks really good so just stress test it, and if you get at least one other uh, currency uh, close or like a reasonable, this is a good one. Good job. Okay, that's a good one. Really good job, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Yeah, it's a good one. Now with this inform extra information, that all mm -hmm. looks good. Just. Stress testing is the only one, but looks really good. Very reasonable, very tradable. Yep. Okay. Uh, no questions on that one? Yeah. And then we have second strategy, which is not a currency strategy anymore, but it's for another mark, mark J. So we have a flow of uh, marks here. So this is a strategy, EMD, 30 minutes, uh, with 12 and a half per trade slip commission. So uh, on this one, so Mark, the equity curve, the underlying equity curve looks really good. It's got low, excuse me, it, it's got a pretty low sample size. It is just 237. Although uh, I have to say something about this. Uh, I do prefer, as you already know, I do prefer higher uh, sample size, but 20 per year is the very minimum. So you are within inside of this very, very minimum. And sometimes if I see a strategy like this and it passes uh, stress testing, 
I, I am willing to um, include it into the portfolio, uh, even with this lower sample size, but it's just like minority of strategies. So maybe five, 10% could be with this low sample size. And one of the reasons is that these strategies with low sample size usually have very favorable correlation to the rest of the portfolio. Your strategy, uh, actually in the screenshot, I don't know if, if I saw drawdown. Um, I think you maybe mentioned it in the email, but overall, all the parameters are really good. So 81,000 profit. I remember that, I don't remember exactly. I think you mentioned the drawdown, but even looking at the equity curve, we can see that uh, there was not a significant big drawdown. And, uh, uh, but I, I remember you mentioned it later. So net profit drawdown ratio is absolutely, absolutely fine and great. Profit factor is really high. Average trade, 342 is phenomenal. Uh, uh, so this is really, this is all really good. Now, when we move to stress test, which is next slide, the stress tests on ES, YM, and NASDAQ all look good as well to me. Like, this is totally okay. This is, you know, I talk quite a few times about stress testing. It doesn't need to be perfect. It's about the tendency, and the tendency is there. So no problem with that. This looks really good as well. I, I really, really like it. Uh, then what Mark did next was, and that's the next slide, he added uh, DPT, dynamic profit taking technique, which is our proprietary technique in hedge fund. And he improved other parameters significantly. So he improved net profit drawdown by 9%, drawdown he improved by 29%. Profit factor by 11%, average trade by 9%, and net profit drawdown ratio by 55%. Oh, actually, yeah, the original was one was eight, but it was eight after transactional cost. We have to remember this. So if we would exclude transactional cost, we easily would be above 10. And he improved it to 12.5. And uh, there was a pretty long uh, uh, explanation and letter uh, from Mark, or he included a file, and he. Uh, we do not need to read it here. He expressed some very honest, um, which I really appreciate, Mark. Very honest self-reflection on when he was implementing the DPT dynamic profit taking technique. He might be quote unquote quote cheating a little bit with the protocol. There was an, uh, I think you said in English, uh, Andrew, hand, hindsight? Hindsight. Yeah, with hindsight. A little bit of, yeah. Yeah, yeah, a bit of a hindsight. So first of all, I really appreciate, Mark, that you're self-honest and you, you brought up this possible, you know, like, quote-unquote, cheating, uh, which definitely could uh, have a negative impact on, um, on the DPT implementation. But here's my point, uh, Mark. This strategy looks really, really good. And because it's got low sample size, which is the only caveat, but it's doable, I would not trade it with the DPT technique because the strategy in its base by itself, it's already good and it already has got this uh, challenge of uh, low, uh, low sample size. And uh, I would not try to force another layer on top of it, especially with these phenomenal parameters, like 342 uh, average trade, because really the initial state is already great, really, really great. So we want to use these dynamic profit taking, dynamic profit taking, for example, when we really need a significant improvement of average trade, but you already do have a phenomenal average trade or, uh, significantly improved net profit drawdown ratio, ratio, but you do already have good pro, uh, net profit drawdown ratio. So, you know, the fact that we have some very neat and very powerful techniques like DPT and DPS doesn't necessarily mean we always need to deploy them. And in this case, I, I would not deploy them, especially knowing that there could be some hindsight, uh, especially 
you know, considering what you wrote uh, me in the email. And uh, I, I would be totally okay. And actually, I, I, I would not be okay trading it with the DPT, but I would be totally okay trading it uh, the way you designed that. So really good work, Mark. I really, really, really like that. It's a really good uh, work. Hmm. Yeah, Mark said it's inspired by the VIA technique in the empowered trader issue, which is the volatility. Um, yeah, yeah. Yep. I've forgotten the I and the A. What do they stand for? Yeah, the, 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 volatility, morning, yeah. the volatility analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Uh, That's the one. <laughs> but, 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 Mark, uh, definitely, you know, put it on a sim trading uh, for a couple of trades and see how it beh behaves. But from my point of view, this looks viable. This looks like a good base, uh, good stress testing, good parameters, robustness level. I think you mentioned robustness level three, if I remember, if you mentioned. But overall, it also includes the transactional costs. Uh, so, yeah. Can, can you specify, Mark, can you just type very quickly, was it robustness level three or robustness level two? Might take a few seconds because there's a delay. Yeah. So I might have to come back to that. But you know, I think I think Andrew that we can be pretty proud because both marks are students of uh, our master class, and I think this is a really inspiring start. Uh, it's it's a you know first babies and currency and uh, work like this. I think it's really. It deserves uh, appreciation. It's, it's really, really good work, guys. I'm, I'm proud of you. You're definitely doing good work, and uh, you know that's a great, very, very great uh, progress. And Mark says robustness level three, long only. Okay, robustness level three. Great, guys. Really good progress. Uh, both marks. Proud of you. These are some really. This is really solid work. Quality work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, We've got a quick. Oh, sorry, Thomas. We've got a question from one, um, which came up when we were looking at the British pound strategy. Let me put this up on the screen. It's a good question. The profit factor of 1.2, is that tradable? Yeah. That, that British uh, pound. It is tradable. And so also it's profit that? factor. It is also because it's profit factor after the transactional costs, first of all. Yeah. Uh, and second, we have... I don't remember. I don't recall from my uh, from my uh, uh, framework and for hedge fund, but we have the threshold something like one point twenty two and one point one. I think we have the threshold something like one point twenty two, uh, but without transactional costs, so it is tradable. Yep. With one point two with transactional costs, is, it definitely is tradable. Okay. All right. Well, we're almost out of time. But, uh, of course, we have to do the quote of the show, <laughs> one of my favorite parts. So let me put this one up on the screen, Thomas, and you can explain it. Here we go. Drum roll, please. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't find any relevant quote related to currencies, but I just wanted to give you a reminder that, uh, that the way to become rich is to make money, not to save it. And, you know, I think this is quite common, especially in, I don't know how about in other countries, but in, in Czech Republic, uh, uh, in my country of origin, uh, saving money is something almost like a prayer or something like a religion. And, you know, people are saving money, but, uh, you know, uh, that, that that's very limiting. That's not the way to, you know, uh, increase your wealth and, and, and make mm -hmm. money. So, so. If you really, uh, I just want to encourage you with this quote. If you guys really want to not necessarily be rich, but improve your wealth situation and create money, uh, definitely don't be afraid to keep uh, working on your trading, keep progressing, start putting your first life position on, learning, expanding, scaling your uh, portfolios. Uh, remember, it's always better to learn uh, how to make money than just uh, possibly save money and then let them be ruined by inflation. So as I said, I'm really proud of you guys. Some really nice strategies 
great progress, great audiences always. And um, we were happy to be with you on this show tonight and we're looking forward to the next one already. Yep. And before we go, Thomas, there was a question from Yoka, which I promised we would come back to. So um, let me put this one up on the screen. This will be the last question of the show for today. This one's come up a few times. It's a good question, though. What's the average lifetime of a strategy before you scrap it? Yeah, good question, Yerka. Uh, we did a lot of research on that. And in our research, the result uh, from our research, uh, research is that the peak life is some somewhere uh, around 18 months. That is one and a half year. It doesn't mean that the strategies stop working after that, but their efficiency and profit factors uh, factor uh, start, might start going down. Although we do have some strategies with, which we successfully trade already for, I think, three or even four years, but just, that's just a minority. But the uh, peak life seems to be somewhere around 18 months. All right. Well, thank you very much for answering that one, Mr. Breakouts. So uh, we're just a little bit over time. So thanks, everyone, for hanging with us today. And uh, hopefully you found a lot of great information in what Thomas has shared. Uh, please express your gratitude by giving us a thumb up on the video. I can see they're already going up now. So thank you very much. And um, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell guy, the little bell icon, I think it's in the corner, which um, notifies you whenever we uh, release new content so you don't want to miss out. On that so uh thanks for very much for your time today um thomas did you want to have some closing comments before we wrap this one my up? my only my only closing comment is guys mr breakouts will be back <laughs> we'll be back in two weeks time and um let's finish off with some thanks for the show today it's always nice to see uh some thanks olga thank you for the thorough answers fantastic show Hey, Chris says, very good detailed presentation. Our pleasure, Chris. Let's go. Let's go. Thanks all. Good show. Yoka, thank you very much, guys. Um, okay. Thanks, guys, from Egyptian. And two more. Arik, take care, everyone. And Neil says, thank you as well. So thanks, everyone, for your joining us today. We had some good questions, some good chat. And, um, yeah, we'll see you in two weeks' time. Any clues, Thomas, on what we're going to be talking about next, or is it a wait and see? I'm, th I'm thinking about, and that's that would be a very special one, I just have to go through the database, how many information I have to share, but I'm thinking about European futures. Oh, interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. And we haven't done bonds yet either, have we, I think? No, 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 no. That, that's the hardest. That's for the very, very end. <laughs> All right. Well, something to look forward to in the coming weeks. So thanks, everyone, for joining us today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up. I can see it's still going up. So thank you. And we'll catch you again in a couple of weeks' time. Cheers. Happy trading. <laughs>